Moving on to our keynote address for you this morning, uh, Internet, New Technologies and the Law, uh, presented by Judge uh, David Harvey, many of you know, and he's been contributing fully and mentioned in many, many tweets that we've had over the last couple of days. Um, just to give you the bio for him, of course, uh, Judge David Harvey was appointed a district court judge in 1989. He's been closely involved with information technology initiatives involving the judiciary undertaken by the former Department of Justice and the present Department of Courts including the uh, development of trial management software. In addition to his uh, judicial duties, Judge Harvey is consultant editor for Butterworth's Electronic Business and Technology Law and a member of the editorial board for Butterworth's Technology Law Forum. He is a part-time lecturer at the Faculty of Law, Auckland University, teaching law and information technology. He's written extensively in the field of law and technology and has presented a number of papers to conferences both in New Zealand and overseas on related topics. He was chair of the Copyright Tribunal for six years and has published a book on the law and network systems entitled The Internet Law.NZ Selected Issues, now in its third edition. Um, that's what the official bio says, but also I can tell you he's very recently been awarded a uh, PhD by Auckland University, which is an absolutely fantastic recognition for the work that he's done. Uh, as a practicing lawyer, I can tell you that his judgments that involve, particularly those involving technology and the law, are very, very widely read throughout the international common law world. Um, so he's very, very influential in that field. And the little bit of trivia that some of you know and some of you may not, of course, he is a mastermind. He was New Zealand's mastermind way back when, uh, and a specialist on Tolkien. So we're very, very privileged to have him as our, uh, yeah, back before it was really cool. Uh, <laughs> We're very privileged to have him as our uh, keynote speaker this morning. Please welcome Judge David Harvey. Thank you for that, Jim. I'd forgotten the last bit. Um, what I want to do this morning, just briefly, is to cover off on a few things that we've been talking about over the last couple of days. And it's within this umbrella of <coughs> internet and new technologies and the law. And I've subtitled it an uncomfortable fit because there are areas where it may be uncomfortable when we're looking at a time of disruptive change. So we'll get started now, as soon as this thing goes. No? Yep, here it goes. Uh, Neo's themes, if you like, in his last message in the first of the Matrix trilogy deals with issues of change, with the fear of change, with the choices that we have, and the existence of rules in a world without borders. And I thought it made a nice little introduction, a nice little summary to some of the themes that I want to cover up on now. Let's Go back to 1992 and imagine Rip Van Winkle has gone to sleep and look at the information technology world that he is living in. There's limited internet availability. It's all dial-up, remember that? There are bulletin boards, there are Usenet groups, there's email, and the World Wide Web has only just begun. So Rip wakes up 20 years later, and what's happened? There has been dynamic, dramatic change. We've now got high-speed broadband, we've got cheap, available internet, we've got computer systems that Rip Van Winkle wouldn't have imagined in 1992. Laptops, notebooks, airbooks, all sorts of stuff, wireless as well. Windows, which was an operating system in its infancy in 1992, has gone through all sorts of iterations. We've had business models that have died, Napster, Grokster, Kazaa, for example, and we've got new business models that have come on stream like Google. 
We've got social networking coming and we've got Facebook, we've got Twitter, we've got streaming video, we've got media convergence. What's a newspaper? Well, if you go online, it can be anything that you imagine. We've had the dot-com boom and bust. We've had a couple of those. We've got digital cameras, iTunes, mobile devices. No aspect of our lives today is untouched by modern communications technologies. You cannot <coughs> avoid it. And of course, Rip, waking up and confronting this dramatic change is probably wishing that it was the way that it was 20 years ago because the change has been too much, it's been too fast. And in many respects, and as Vikram suggested, he's not alone. Today, we are at a crossroads. We can destroy the advantages that the internet gives us. We can destroy the advantages of change, or we can make some smart choices and we can head on into our new digital future. There are two roads that we can travel because what is going to happen is the choices that we make now are going to govern the lives of our children and our grandchildren who will be the digital natives. I am not a digital native. I am a digital immigrant. I don't speak with the accent <coughs> of the digital native. But the one path that we can follow doesn't do much for creativity, doesn't do much for innovation, doesn't do much for self-expression, it's going to lock it all down, it's going to clamp it all up. The other path looks at the advantages that we can take from new technologies, recognising the risks, dealing with the risks, but not at the expense of the new technology. And here's the thing, problem is that the first option is probably going to happen more likely than the second, and the reason for that is fear, because we're afraid. As Neo, as Neo said, we're afraid. And I call it the Frankenstein complex. Mary W. Shelley, back at the beginning of the 18th century, writes Prometheus Unbound. The doctor creates a being, creates a model of man. And it gets out of control. And it's been a common theme in literature, particularly science fiction, ever since. HAL 9000 in 2001, a space odyssey. The computer run rampant, it had a hidden agenda. And of course the very successful Terminator franchise is built upon the premise that the technology is going to run rampant, the technology is going to be out of control. Part of the problem is that that type of fear, that type of worry is taken up as Simon Power said in October of 2010, describing the online world as a wild west, it's taken up and there needs to be some kind of rule, there needs to be some kind of regulation, there needs to be some kind of standards. And of course media feed the fear with their stories of cyberbullying and online sexual predators, internet addiction, there was an interesting story <coughs> on television just the other day about addiction to smartphones. I was wondering whether or not, in fact, it was a failure to recognise that this is the new way that people are going to communicate. There's pornography, there's data leaks, WikiLeaks, and so on and so forth, and none of this is new. We've had bullying for centuries. Sexual predators used to sit outside schools in their cars with a bag of candy. Addictions have been around for as long as man has been. You just need to go to Pompeii and to the archaeological ruins to see some pretty interesting pornography. And some of you may remember Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers. That was a story of a leak as well. It's not the technology. It's a matter of behaviour because all of these behaviours predate the internet. It is not the technology. We, in fact, are the problem. As I've said earlier on at this conference, and there's the source, we have met the enemy, and he is us. It's our problem. It's behaviour. And the thing is that this fear that we have of new technologies may lead to a reaction, and often this reaction involves the law, as Simon Power suggested. Let's take a few examples. These are cases that dealt with copyright issues. And I focus upon them because they are interesting ways in which the courts were called upon to address new technologies. First was the Betamax case. Betamax was a video cassette format. It was a contest between v uh, VCR and Betamax, but <clears throat> it's called the Betamax case because it dealt with Betamax. 
What had happened was that Sony had developed the Betamax video recorder. The Motion Picture Association got very upset about this. In fact, Jack Valenti, who was the chair of the Motion Picture Association of America, said that the video cassette recorder was to the movie industry as the Boston Strangler was to women living alone. The matter went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. The movie industry wanted the Betamax video recorder banned because it was involved in copyright infringement, the recording of television programs and movies. The United States Supreme Court said no, we're not going to ban it because this device has a whole lot of substantial non-infringing uses. You can record a program and you can watch it later. That's called time shifting and that's okay. And what happened was that it did not uphold the movie industry's request to have the video cassette recorder banned. So what happened was that the, music, the, video industry, the movie industry recognised that at last they had a business opportunity here. They could release all of their back catalogue on videos. And they could release after video, on video cassettes, and after video cassettes they could release them on DVD. Hollywood makes more money out of DVD sales than it does out of the box office. Just imagine if that business opportunity had been lost as a result of the banning of the video cassette recorder. Similarly with the Diamond Rio. Diamond, the Rio was a, an MP3 player, one of the early ones. The recording industry wanted to ban people shifting, format shifting their CDs into MP3 format and listening to them on their Rio MP3 player. The court similarly held no because format shifting is okay as long as you've legitimately acquired the CD, that's all right, not a problem. Just imagine what would have happened then if MP3s had been banned, no iTunes, no iPod, a loss of a business opportunity. The reel-to-reel -reel cassette recorder, this was an English case, CBS Songs and Amstrad. Obviously it's being used for copyright infringement said CBS Songs. No, said the court, there are a whole lot of non-infringing uses to which it can be put. It's not been marketed as a device for infringing copyright. We're going to let the reel-to-reel -reel cassette recorder remain. So you can see that sometimes the law can be rather a clumsy object when it comes into contact with technology and fortunately in those cases the request by the various copyright owners were not upheld and new business opportunities developed. And you sometimes wonder when new technologies come online why it is that people try to shut it down rather than take advantage of the new opportunities that are presented. Cases are one way, legislation is another. And the legislative process, as far as I'm concerned, has an awful lot to recommend it. In this country, there are a number of pieces of legislation that deal with new technologies. The first was an attempt in 1994, the Technology and Crimes Reform Bill. If that had ever got passed, the internet wouldn't be with us because the costs of compliance that were required in those days meant that ISPs were saying, we can't live with this, we're going to go out of business. It wasn't passed. But there have been subsequently a number of other pieces of legislation. The Electronic Transactions Act is a big umbrella piece of legislation that validates electronic transactions in the same way as paper. It's a lovely piece of legislation and I say that not because you know lawyers have this affair with legislation, but because there have never been any cases on it. It is a piece of statute, it is a piece of legislation that has worked and worked admirably. And the consultation process that went on before the ETA was wonderful. And it's one of those opportunities where citizens can get involved in the passage of legislation. Similarly, the Unsolicited Electronic Messages Act, which is the SPAM Act, a very successful piece of legislation. You don't read too much about it because an awful lot goes on under the hood. But Department of Internal Affairs is managing the issue of SPAM. They've had to take a couple of cases in New Zealand against serious infringers, but by and large it has worked. Copyright File Sharing uh, Act 2011 got off to a lumpy start with Section 92A. But following that, the consultation process was excellent. The opportunity that citizens had to input into the process was wonderful. And similarly, 
the Copyright New Technologies Amendment Act, the Digital Amendments to the Copyright Act of 2008 that allowed for, file sh uh, for uh, format shifting and matters of that nature. So the legislative process actually has, a wonder has an awful lot to recommend it because people can get in touch. And of course we've got the proposed new media laws coming up on the horizon that the Law Commission is currently looking into. But the real fear I think that we've got to deal with, the real fear that we've got to confront is the fear of change and the unknown that accompanies it. And I pick up from what Vikram said just a few minutes ago. It is a real worry because we don't like change. But when we think about trying to regulate technology or slow it down or pass a law that requires a man to walk in front of the vehicle with the flag, we have to remember that technologies don't just bring change to the world that we live in, they actually change us as well. Our behaviours change, particularly as far as IT is concerned, our expectations of information change. You, know, you don't have to go down to the library to get a book to look something up anymore, the information comes to you. We approach and process information in a different way. And as a result of this, our attitudes begin to change. And finally, and we don't realise this, our values and our understandings begin to change as well. And that's just on the psychological level. On the physiological level, there are also changes. Now, the way that I'm communicating with you now is the only natural way that human beings communicate, orally. Writing, reading, it's all learned. It's not in our DA. Talking is, but everything else has to be learned. So when you learn to read and when you learn to write, there are changes that are taking place up here. Neurological changes, you didn't know that. You actually don't feel it. But once it's happened, it remains there forever. And the thing is that every generation has to relearn it. So every time you come in touch with a new technology, even driving a car or operating a computer or something of that, learning to type, you're undergoing physical changes, neurological changes as well. As well. And this gives some validity <coughs> to Marshall McLuhan's comment that he made in 1964, that we shape our tools, we make the tools, and then, whether we like it or not, our tools shape us. But technology also drives change by other means. McLuhan also said, and this is one of his more opaque statements, the medium is the message. And what he was saying was that we focus on the content of what we read or what we see or what we hear or what we re see on the internet. We focus on the content, but the medium by which it is delivered is as important because the medium itself is going to affect society. And every new technology has certain characteristics or qualities that define it or differentiate it from what went on before and define and differentiate the ways in which we communicate. The first information technology was the printing press. And the printing press had a number of qualities, not just the fact that it was mechanised printing, but the qualities kind of, I can give you some examples, the quality of dissemination of information, the quality of standardisation of information, the quality of fixity of information that differentiated it from the manuscript culture that went before it. And every new communications technology that has come along since has built upon those characteristics and added a few others. So when you look at digital technologies, you've got things like persistence of information, the document that never dies. Once it's out there, it's out there and you can't stop it, you can't bring it back, even if you're going to take the website down. Information is also dynamic. It can change. And we've got continuing disruptive change, a matter that Vikram, Vikram was talking about, but it is ongoing. And rather like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel, it's just going to continue and continue and continue. We can't stop it. And this is as a result of the wonderful quality of permissionless innovation that the internet allows. The backbone's there, you can build anything you like and put it on. And if you build it, they will come. And they do and they have. Another problem that you've got though is dissociative or disinhibitive enablement. By that I mean that you can do all sorts of terrible things to people without actually having to look them in the eye. 
In my view, the internet fraudster is a lot more dangerous than the person who comes into the shop and tries to pass a check because at least the person in the shop trying to pass a check has got to eyeball the victim. The person on the internet is completely dissociated from their crime, dissociated from their victim, no empathy whatsoever. And of course you've got remote access to information, you've got searchability, you've got retrievability, you've got participation in information, you've got the sharing of information, all wonderful characteristics of these new technologies and those are just a few of them. And they enable digital natives. Those technologies enable digital natives. But they scare the hell out of other people because we don't understand or we don't speak the same language or we don't quite get it. And one of the things, one of the examples of this can be seen in social networking. If you could roll it. So you look at that and you think to yourself, in the face of this change, what's the problem with the law? And, and I'm going to address that. And this is a question that needs to be answered before we actually get into the rights and wrongs of regulation and whether or not we should regulate. You see, the thing about the law is that it is static, it is conservative, it is hard to change, it operates on concepts of precedent, which are ways of looking at things through a re rearview mirror, and we look to the past for new solutions. Now, I recognize all of these problems. I love the law, don't get me wrong. I've been in it, it's been my life, and, and I've done very well out of it. But there are problems that it has, and you've got to recognize it. And one of the other problems is that the law is underpinned by the values that exist at the time that the court case is decided or the law is passed. And the thing is that those values will remain as long as the law remains. And that part of it has to do with this rear view problem that we have. And McLuhan made a comment about rear view thinking or rear view mirror. It's a mode of thinking where we actually don't see what's coming down the track until it's already there, until it has already hit us. The change has happened, and by the time we recognize it's happened, it is too late. And instead of looking ahead, a lot of the time, and Vikram made this point, a lot of the time we've got to cling to the past, and we do that. 
And we're always a little bit behind the eight ball as far as what's coming down the track is concerned. And we don't recognize the technology and what it's doing that is responsible for the, trip, for the shift. But like all human beings, we like to know what's going to happen next. And this is part and parcel of the problem with fear of change. See, the lovely thing about the law, every lawyer will tell you, yes, well, we've got to have consistency, certainty, and predictability. Because on that way, you can organize your affairs. You don't have that. You don't know whether or not the contract that you're entering into is enforceable. But the law at least prescribes certain rules that allow for that. But as I've said, the problem is that the values that are relevant at the particular time that the law is passed or the case is decided stay as long as the law play, stays in place or until it is changed. In that respect, a law that goes on for 25, 30 years can become a rearview mirror if the values that underpin it have changed since then. And here's the thing. You see, digital natives don't look at it in the same way that digital immigrants do. They see that the law is out of date, it's inapplicable, it doesn't work. And let's take a couple of examples. Let's have a look at privacy. Marie's going to probably burn me at the stake for this, but hey. Yeah. It actually started, the first case about privacy was in 1867. Alexander Dumas, the author of The Three Musketeers, had some photographs taken with his mistress. The photographer, enterprising fellow, saw that there was a business opportunity here and wanted to sell them. Dumas didn't want him to do so, and he bought an action in copyright. The court said, no, we're not going to allow the action in copyright, but we are going to allow the action to succeed because you're entitled to a right of privacy in 1867. Every privacy lawyer will refer you to an article in 1890 in the Harvard Law Review by Warren and Brandeis entitled The Right to Privacy. That's the basis, pretty much, of the philosophy that underpins privacy law. And in that article, there was comment about gossip and the trade that had taken place in gossip that was pursued with industry as well as effrontery. So you had a situation where celebrities and lawyers and paparazzi and the gossip media were all there in 1890, right at the beginning of the right to privacy, and they're all players that still occupy the terrain today. But the important thing that you've got to remember is that the article was written for a different paradigm than we're in now. It was written for the print paradigm, and the values and the basis and the concerns and so on and so forth have to be seen as evolving within that particular context. Now, after World War II and the reaction against totalitarian states and state surveillance and so on and so forth, and 1984, there was a reaction to this type of activity, and it gave rise to a new approach to privacy law. The cartoon refers to the fact that they're reading 1984 in Miss Smith's English class, which has a certain irony to it. But today, you see, the problem is with all the social media is that we are conceding privacy rights and not only social media. But social media is one thing because the reason that we concede our privacy rights is because we want to be part of the group. We want to be accepted. And only by being accepted, by being, by, by being accepted, we've got to share our photographs. We've got to share that we went down to the pub last night. We've got to share that we went to a wild party. Oh, and by the way, here's the picture. And that, by that way, we get accepted. But by the same token, we're making some awful concessions as far as our privacy is concerned. And these behaviours, these new behaviours that are taking place, are all underpinned by the qualities of the new technologies that are provided to us. We make unwitting disclosure every time we use our credit card. You can leave a trail a mile wide. Where did you go? What time was it? What date was it? How much did you spend? And what did you spend it on? All over town just with a credit card. It happens. What do you think that little black strip on the back of the credit card is for? Mobile phones, same thing. Now, Apple will tell you that, yes, you can switch off the location thing on your, on your iPhone. But the fact of the matter is that they work on locating with cell phone towers. That's underneath the other stuff. And you can be tracked on that. There was a murder case a few years ago that relied on mobile lo location data to pinpoint where a particular person was at a particular time. 
So the problem is that we're willingly prepared to disclose all of this information as well as the unwilling stuff. We, we may disclose it to people that we know, to friends, look, I've got a problem. Or alternatively, people we've never met. I've never met you, but I've got a problem. And we seem to be prepared to compromise our privacy. And it isn't the state that's the problem. It isn't Google. It isn't Facebook. It isn't the corporates. They're not the enemy. We concede our privacy once again. We've met the enemy, and he is us. Digital natives may not be too concerned about this. They may be prepared to let it go. The question is, because you've probably gathered that I'm a little bit concerned about this, am I trying to impose my digital immigrant values on digital natives who will be developing an entirely different value system? They have developed their values within an entirely different paradigm. Let's talk a little bit about copyright. We've already been there. But copyright is the child of the print paradigm. Didn't exist before the printing press came along. Printing press enabled the commodification of books. And if you look at copyright <coughs> from one perspective, it is a business model. But the, when the copyright came along with the Statute of Anne 1710, and David Farrar talked about that, authors were given control over who could copy their work, and they were given it for a set period of time. Interesting aside is that the copyright after death was uh, a, 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 an idea that was promulgated by the poet Wordsworth. And the reason that he put it out was that he wanted to make sure that his family would be provided for with the income from his works after he died. So that's why you have the life plus 20, 50, 70 years, or whatever. It was Wordsworth, the poet, who got it started because he wanted to provide for his family after he went. Now, what has happened is that as new technologies have come online, new concepts as far as copyright have to develop. But most of them develop within the en environment of a capital-intensive type of business. Cost a lot of money to set up a printing press. Cost a lot of money to set up a recording studio. Cost a lot of money to set up a movie studio. That all changed when the photocopier came along and the digital paradigm has changed it even more because one of the facts about the stuff that we use, all of our digital devices, is that copying is necessary. It happens. And current copyright principles must recognize that. And I think what we've got to do is really reflect back a little bit on the real purpose of copyright law, which is not to maximize revenues for rights holders. Copyright is a beautiful piece of social contract. And some people might say that I'm a copyright fundamentalist because of this, and I have made no secret about it. I have always been in favor of copyright law, and I believe our Copyright Act has got it right. Copyright sets an appropriate boundary between enabling the freedom to use ideas and information on the one hand and protect expressions of ideas and information in order to encourage investment in creative and innovative works. It is part and parcel of a social contract that, st that involves a statutorily created property right. There is no inherent property in intellectual property. It is created by statute. And the rules that govern intellectual property are set out in the statute, nowhere else. Now, creators can determine today the extent of copyright below the gold standard that the Copyright Act gives us. You can set up a Creative Commons license or an open source license or whatever, fine. But at the top, the ceiling, if you like, is the gold standard of the Copyright Act. And if you're worried about people who are stealing your intellectual property and stealing your stuff, focus upon them. Focus upon the infringers rather than the people who may circumvent technological protection measures to make a Region 1 DVD work on their Region 4 DVD player. You see, what we've got to do as we move into this new changing technological world is to craft law with fundamental principles. And an example of that can be seen with the Electronic Transactions Act, which is an excellent piece of legislation. We've got to make laws that are workable, We've got to make laws that are going to be respected, that won't bring the law into disrepute, because digital natives are going to work around the law 
The word, I think, is hack. They'll work around the law if they don't like it. Now, you see, when you look at file sharing, for example, your file sharing technologies like Napster and LimeWire and FrostWire and so on and so forth, they're all yesterday's technology. BitTorrent, David Farrer excluded, is out the window. Virtual private networks and magnet links mean that file sharing can be undetectable. And remember that act that was passed last year? You see, it may well be out of date already. So just to finish off, what we need to do is to rethink the way in which we're doing things. We need to rethink our business models. And what we've got to work out is how we can craft laws, umbrella types of laws that are going to recognize the way in which te technology changes things and that will support them for the future and not the past. And indeed, we may need even to th rethink the way that we are. I want to close with a quote <clears throat> from a book about uh, a game. Uh, and the game is Grand Theft Auto. Uh, and I've never played it, and if I had, I wouldn't co confess it anyway. But, <laughs> but if I did play it, I would say that it would be to understand the criminal mind. <laughs> no other reason. You see, the thing is that as times change, the people who are coming into power are going to bring different values. The things that I've said worry us the fear, the change, the new technology, and so on and so forth. I, don't, I wouldn't classify myself as the cultural elite, neither cultural nor elite, but we would worry about all of this sort of stuff. The people who are coming online are just going to consider our fears as no more and no less than rock and roll. And here they are. These are the people of the future. And those are just a few pictures I would add to them People like Sam Morgan. I would add to them the entrepreneurs who are present in New Zealand. I would add to them every single one of you because you wouldn't be here if you weren't interested in what's around the corner. Thank you very much. Outstanding. We've got time for some questions, and I'm sure there must be some. I'm not sure if we've got some. Oh, we have got some roving mics. Uh, your, yours was first hand up. Thank you. I teach a series of eight lectures called Future Apps, in which I'm looking at things like driverless vehicles, smart metering, and housing, and a number of issues like that. And what I find, thank you, and what I find is that uh, a large number of people are totally blanked out. We are currently planning on putting trams up Queen Street, whereas Paris and West Berlin are going to put driverless vehicles in place. Have you got any hints as to how I can move the world and get them to change? <laughs> Simple question. If you, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> Legally, you can't do it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, talk to the legislators. I'm sure that, that they will listen. Right, right at the back? Yep. Um, just a point, I noticed that you said that the Statue of Anne gave rights to authors. Now, the Statue of Anne, and I heard this incorrectly quoted before, was actually designed to clean house with King James V's handing out a bunch of patents to his lackeys, and it's much more a patent law to allow the Publishers Guild to trade in copyrights between themselves than it is anything to do with the authors. Um, I don't have time to answer that because... <laughs> That was one of the things that I looked at in my thesis. <laughs> and you and I could have a very long talk about that. <laughs> Starting with the stationer's company, 1407, but we won't go there. <laughs> but yeah, let's talk. Uh, because the Statute of Anne, among other things that it did, did give the authors their rights. Yeah. A legal question arose in the education uh, breakout uh, regarding uh, uh, public payment for uh, creation of educational materials, which are then owned exclusively by the Board of Trustees of each school. Mm -hmm. uh, can the law be changed to make uh, learning materials openly available? Um, I think there's something in the permitted use sections that does cover educational materials, at, at least in part.
But with a copyright review coming up next year, that probably is something that could be looked at further. Uh, it, it would be covered by a permitted use, I should imagine, but it would be something that you could discuss with the Ministry of Economic Development um, and with um, the politicians and the select committee who will be looking at the review of the Copyright Act. We've got yeah. time for one more. One more? This, yes, the young gentleman there. Um, what's, in your opinion, the best way to prevent piracy and does it even need preventing? Um, <laughs> okay, let, let, first let's, defend pi let's define piracy because it, is, it, it, it has a different term. In the Copyright Act, it's called commercial copyright infringement. It is the infringement of copyright that involves a person profiting from their infringement by basically on selling somebody else's stuff without their permission. Um, yeah, I mean, the law, the law has ways of dealing with this. I mean, you just need to go along to a flea market to see that there is piracy in place where people are selling uh, silver DVDs that aren't marked up properly or anything like that. That's what happened with Siani's wedding. Um, it is, it is rather difficult to trace. There are ways and means of doing it, and copyright owners do do it, and there are plenty of powers that the law has, including a civil search warrant, which is quite draconian, uh, that enables people to uh, enter premises and take computers away and, and all the rest of it. It used to be called an Anton Pillar order. It's now called a search order. So, yeah, there are, there are ways and means. And uh, should we worry about it? Well, the Copyright Act says we should. And it's in the Copyright Act, and I've said the Copyright Act for me is the gold standard as far as copyright law is concerned. So uh, I hope that answers the second part of your question. Thank you very right, much. Right, that's, sorry, that's all we have time for. Thanks again. Okay, and thank you. Yep, yeah, that's it. Oh, yes, sorry. Very good of the speaker to remind me that I had a gift to give him, and here it is. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lawyer, <laughs> and he instructed me to do that, I to did. remind him, and a lawyer always follows his instructions, so hey. I have one, I have one more instruction for you. Uh, they had one slide up there that had reference to the dot-com boom and bust. I thought the dot-com bust was something that you weren't allowed to talk about while you were here, but never mind, we'll move on.